Good afternoon, everyone. It's heartwarming to see so many familiar faces before me. Can you hear me clearly, even at the back? President, fellows and guests, Troy House is the only ducal mansion in the whole of Wales. However, that being said, it's only just in Wales, lying as it does one mile south of the border town of Monmouth, as shown here. This 1994 aerial photograph shows the key components of the estate, where the nearest main road is this one that links Monmouth about here to Raglan, and then a track comes off that, passes over T, which is the river Trophy, in two positions, the Trophy having been made to branch into two to help alleviate flooding that it's famous for, so near to the house. Then it rejoins this one water course and enters the river Y, still relatively close to the house, at about here on this scale. B is the boundary that's existed since an auction in 1901 between the house, H, I hope you can see that, and the estate farm, F, which you can see is exceptionally close to the historic house. The house is on a north-south alignment where north is to your right. At the top of the screen, on the west side of the house, is this walled garden of some four acres with its original stone walls, and then the whole of this surrounded by farmland and parkland. When I first started to investigate Troy in 2010, little was known about its history, even by Cadwell and the Royal Commission. It took me a year to persuade the owner of Troy House to give me access, and even then only very limited access was granted. Now there's no access to the house at all for anyone, whilst the 2008 contentious planning application to convert the mansion into flats crumbles on and on. And the house literally crumbles away due to extensive water penetration. I sought to research Troy's architectural and design landscape history as far as I was able to before the house became even more fragile and lost forever. I used a multi-method approach which included archaeology, the watch poetry of the nobility, and various types of pictorial and documentary searches. The few publications that do exist on Troy <coughs> always show this section of the house, which because it faces north, I call the North Range. And the publications also usually say that the house was built by Henry Somerset, first Duke of Beaufort. But this is only partly true. It's true that he built this north range, but it's actually joined to substantially more building an older Troy house. But this connection with the Beauforts was my starting point in research, and I approached Badminton House archives for access. Those archives contain some Troy estate accounts from the 17th century, and they also hold the Somerset family papers and all of those prove useful. I found that amongst the accounts for 1681 to 84 that the first Duke had indeed commissioned the North Range to make Troy House grander and so more fitting as his son and heir's first marital home. The work cost some £3,000. And then I just found a letter written by the first Duke of Beaufort to the first Duchess where he says that he's approaching a Robert Warren to give advice on the structure of the new build at Troy House. And simultaneously, it seems that he was also um, asking for advice from Robert Warren to make changes to the house at Chelsea. None of this was previously known in the architectural literature. So that was a good golden moment. And shortly afterwards, I had another one. When I discovered one of the family letters which seemed to explain to my mind that uh, Troy did indeed go into a slow decline after the date of when this letter was written. It was a pivotal moment in Troy's history. And because of that, I am going to read this letter to you. It's written at four o'clock in the morning, on the 30th of July, 1698, by Rebecca, Marchioness of Worcester, she was married to the first Duke's only surviving son and heir, and they've made Troy their marital home. 
She's writing this letter to her mother-in-law, so it's the first Duchess of Beaufort, who was in residence at Buckington. And Rebecca is writing this from her cousin's house at La Rothal, which is now on the Herefordshire Monshire border. She addresses her mother-in-law as Madam, times have changed, and she writes this. I am under so much trouble and concern for my lord, that's Charles, her husband, that I scarce know what I write. My lord came hither yesterday to church. We went from hence soon after seven in the evening, designing to return to Troy, but it pleased God the horses turning too short, the coachman was flung out of the box. The horses ran away down the hill and overturned the coach before the postillion could stop them, and my lord, apprehending the danger we were in, jumped out of the coach. The coach wheel missed him very narrowly. He has bruised his thigh very much, but Dr. Tyler, who is with him, hopes there is nothing out, nothing broken. My lord is very faint and complains much of a sickness in his stomach, and has had yet but an ill night. Now, carrying on to the second page now, where I've got to here, ill night. He was let blood about 12 o'clock when Mr. Tyler came. I have presumed to send my lord's Duke's servant by Bristol to hasten Dr. Basco with her. He was the Duke's doctor. I return most humble thanks to my Lord Duke and your Grace for your great favours to the children, begging your Grace's pardon for this scribbled letter. Well, we don't know if the Duke's doctor actually arrived uh, to care for Charles, but we do know that Charles died later that day, aged just 38. And this famous family portrait of the first Duke and the family shows Charles at the end here. This is the first Duke, the first Duchess. They have three daughters and two sons, but little Arthur here predeceased Charles. And Charles, although he chose Troy as the marital home, Charles had been the administrator of the Duke's extensive Welsh estates. Troy had served as an administrative centre. And when Charles was killed and there was no son and heir to take on the role of administrator, it was to, and because his son was only four years old at the time and was being brought up at Buckington, it was decided to put stewards in to Troy to carry on Charles's work. Anything of real value at Troy, paintings, furniture, was transferred to Buckington House, and the stewards that they appointed over succeeding centuries only occupied four rooms in Troy. Um, of the succeeding successive generations, only the fifth, sixth, and eighth Dukes of Beaufort periodically resided at Troy, mainly for hunting purposes and fishing on the nearby River Wye. And it's for that reason that when John Byng visited Troy in 1781, he's an acid writer of the Twyington Diaries, he said that the rooms were so barely furnished and he felt it no breach of manners to go rummaging in odd places. So that date of 1698 is key in Troy's history. It did start a steady decline. Until 1901, when it was decided, um, as was common with a lot of country estates at the beginning of the 20th century, the Beauforts decided that they would auction off the Troy estate and many other Monmouthshire properties that they owned at that time. The auction was actually um, instigated by the Eighth Duke's heir. Troy Farm sold straight away. The house sold a year later in 1902, as did the Wall Garden. And it was sold to an Edward Arnott, who first leases it and then eventually sells it to the same group of people in 1906. There were French endless nuns escaping religious persecution in France. They were of the order of Our Lady of Charity and Refuge at Saint Florent and Saint Maur. And you might well ask, how did nuns over there know in a tiny place in Monmouthshire that there was a Troy house up for sale? All will become clear. This is the only picture I could find of a nun actually at Troy House, where Troy House is shown in the background, and an understanding of the walled garden. I was interested in the bee bulbs, there were two of them, there's one here obviously, and then there's another one close to the house. Catherine said they were 17th century, and to my mind they looked earlier, so I approached the bee association to see if they registered these bee bulbs. Fortunately they had, they visited when they took this picture 
1957. And in their registration of that date, they say that they are 16th century. That pleased me enormously because I thought they were probably from that date. Not only that, but they got contemporary with the walls of the walled garden, which had also been reckoned to be 17th century. I think they were earlier than that. The nuns turned the house into a refuge for girls in need of a home, but they also run it as a maudlin laundry. And this picture is from a little book in Monmouth Museum. That's the vehicle that they use for those activities. And during the time that they were there, members passed on. So the nuns created this little cemetery in the wall garden, furthermost point away from the house, where if you look carefully, you can see the outline of the pillar here, if you look for the big stones. And then another one here. So this is the original entrance to the wall garden. They blocked that and there are 25 souls buried here. And as I discovered by checking deeds, the original Mother Superior who came from France to set up the convent is buried here, Sister Mary of the Blessed Sacrament, who died in 1915 in her sixth. During their time at Troy, which was from 1902 until 1977, they made no changes to the historic house. Shown here, if you can get your eye in, as what the like capital letter T. But what they did in the 1960s, because one of the nuns seems to have come into some substantial inheritance, was to build a chapel and cloisters which they attached to the historic house on this side, the east side of the house. Then on the other side, they attached the theatre, laboratories, because they ran the convent as a school for girls, a hostel for girls, a garage, a store, and a substantial covered games area. Here's the boundary between the house and the farm. And you can see from this how exceptionally close the farm comes here. This is the historic from the St. Troy. It in turn is joined to a stone barn. And then it was joined to another stone building to enclose what we now call the farmyard. But in the 1950s, the then farmer uh, demolished part of it to get his milk tankers in. The land struggled financially during a whole time that they were there, from 1902 to 1977, when it's decided that they will sell the house and the wall garden and nearby Elm Tree House, which they purchased in 1906. Um, and it's from this point that the estate becomes even more fractured in its ownership. The house sells to a gentleman who still owns the house, although has never lived in it, as a caretaker, who um, amazingly is actually occupying the same rooms in the North Range that Stuart did in the late 17th century. The wall garden was sold to someone else who built a bungalow in that wall garden, and a nearby Elm Tree House sold to another couple who still own it. In 1983, the owner of Troy House leases it to two special needs teachers who take a year to repair the building and then um, open the school as a special school for boys with the co first cohort going in in 1984. But when the rent substantially increased, it's no longer financially viable and that special school closes in 1991. Then as I've already said, 2008, a planning application is submitted to turn the house into flats. That was passed last year by Monmouthshire County Council, but was immediately called in by the Welsh Government. It's then going to appeal at the beginning of this year and we will wait the outcome. Meanwhile, the fabric of Troy um, is very fragile with severe water penetration to the extent that for three of the beautiful plaster ceilings, um, two of them are no longer in existence. However, the house itself apart from um, what I've just said, is largely unchanged since that fatal accident of 1698. That's the recent history. I was interested to know how far back they take the history of Troy, and in that respect, um, ecclesiastical records prove useful. I found that a Breton called, and I can be corrected on this later, if I'm not pronouncing this name correctly, Buffel, founded a Benedictine priory at Monmouth with assistance from William of Dole, abbot of Saint-Florent at Samor, 
and that happened in 1070. Now you know how the nuns knew about Troy being up for sale in 1902. The two Catholic communities continued contact. Grants to the Abbey of Sobel were made by Bethnal with several churches along the Trophy River. A mid 12th century terrier of this abbey's possessions in Britain shows it was claiming as a possession a church at Troy. This is separate to Mitchell Troy, which is another village further along the Trophy. And this church at Troy is identified as St. John of Troia, T R O I A. Troy has had various names across time. Troy Parva and Little Troy to distinguish it from the bigger Mitchell Troy. A church of Troy is also listed in the taxations of 1254 and 1291, and a reference to the church also appears in the 1404 register of Bishop Richard Clifford of Worcester, where the entry states 1404 Rector Hugh Vaughan of St. John Baptist of Troy. So as a history of the church, these going back to the mid 12th century terror. And I was interested to know, was the dwelling actually associated with this church? It was certainly um, some 100 metres from the house, on the banks of the trophy, there are the remains of a water driven medieval mill. And close by, several pieces of medieval pottery have been found by the professional body of Monmouth archaeologists, Steve Clark, if you know him, he's a fellow. The farmhouse and barn around the current farmyard also appear to date from medieval times. This is the farmhouse, it's a north-south alignment, and it's joined at right angles to the stone barn, which, to my mind, looks as if it was originally a wooden structure, which later was infilled with stone. This early photograph of Troy shows it during um, its last years in ownership of the Beauforts shows the North Range, but you can also see behind it some of the older portion of Troy House. Gardens really well attended. And then this is the perimeter garden wall, where this side of it here is that track from the main road, and it continues on around the house and enters the farmyard, where this slide is showing. So the farmhouse on the right, and then the southern elevation of Troy is facing you. And you can't see anything at all of the North Range. And if you think that this chimney is sticking out of the lorry, which is permanently parked in the farm, no, <laughs> no it's not. It's attached to this uh, lowest section of Troy House, closest to the farmyard and the farm buildings. And it's where the nuns have their laundry. It's to do with the boiler system. If you look carefully, there appears to be an opening here. There's an upbroad ivy here. And there is an old photograph of this entrance to Troy House from the farmyard, but it's very, very foggy, not fit for showing you. But my artist cousin, bless her, did this little watercolour to show what it was trying to show. So yes, we've got stone pillars with boards on top. And the yellow is where the chapel was built. Chapel and cloisters in the 1960s by the nuns. And this is the oldest door in Troy House, but it's not in its original position. I found that the, um, what will be shown later, to be the oldest part of Troy, where they had their laundry, it started life there. But when we used this building as a laundry, it wasn't wide enough for that purpose, to get clothes in and out, so they took it off, made the opening wider and put it in here. But the cloister's position makes it really difficult to do any archaeology in this area. This is before cloisters and chapel were built. It, the Royal Commission Ancient and Historic Monuments of Wales visited in the 1950s and took this photograph. The nuns used this area before cloisters and chapels were built as a private garden area. The girls weren't allowed in here. And these rooms here are the ones that you'll see later as being the, um, they contain Jacobean plaster ceilings. So they use these as the key reception areas. This block here is from the 8th Duke's time, Victorian time. It's a bathroom block, stuck onto the historic house. So over here is the um, section used as a laundry. Then most of this 
In my view, given limited access, is Tudor, but with Jacobean grandissement. And sticking out here into the garden area is the first Duke of Beaufort's stairwell, which joins the old part of Troy House to the North Range, built in 1681-4. This wall also, if you look carefully at the windows, very similar. That's to join the old to the new, so to speak. And if you look here, it looks as if there's an exposed lintel and an exposed floor joist. And to my mind, I think that this part of Troy House extended across this garden area. And when the North Range was built, I think most likely it was knocked down, perhaps to give more light to the stairwell. Because if you look at the chimney stack, it's got coins, very similar in design and the dimensions and material used as the coins on this stairwell and on the corners of the North Range. This is the east elevation of Troy House, and we've got a really ugly juxtaposition of the North Range with its three stories, and the older part of Troy House, which I think is probably Tudor with Jacobean uh, aggrandizement, and that's Ashram. There's the chapel attached to it. Yes, this was hard originally, because I stuck there on it. But this, um, it's, this juxtaposition of two completely different architectural styles is typical of the first two. You see it in various places at Buckington House. This is inside the stairwell, where the staircase in its design is typical of the late 17th century. It goes from the basement right up to the attic. And at each of the three floors of the North Range, the modern build, you get a little flight of steps to take you into the older part of Troy House, the nearest floor of the four-storey structure. This is my attempt at a building phase plan. So remembering that Troy House resembles the capital letter T, north is to the top of the screen. So the pink bits are the 1681-4 build. So the north range constitutes most of the top of the T. There's the stairwell, and there's the connecting um, wall to join onto the older part of Troy down here. I still think this is Tudor. And that's where the Jacobian plaster ceilings are. That's the bathroom block. And then, although this wall is older than the North Range, it appears that when the North Range was built, they altered the windows here, perhaps to make it look more coherent as a design when viewed from this direction. Evidence of a crosswind here, where that's where I think it actually continued further out, hence the dotted the dots. And then down here, I'm convinced that this is medieval. This is where the nuns start their laundry. There's plasterboard inside, hiding the original wall. And then on the other side is where the nuns have the theatre, and there's plasterboard there. But there is a gap between the original wall and that plasterboard, so I was able to squeeze into it. And walking along that gap along here, there are window openings which are completely hidden from view, and they contain um, window grills, metal ones, which to my mind look medieval in design. There's an awful lot more could be done on the architectural history of Troy um, and access, not being able to access is a real frustration for me. So how is this state laid out? We've got two estate maps, uh, the earliest unfortunately is only 1712, next one 1765. It's a surviving tide map of 1845, a uh, very detailed first edition of L of uh, OS map 1881. This is the earliest estate map of 1712. Uh, it's only A5 size, and yet it's got this lovely little sketch of the North Range, which would only have been about 30 years old at the time, and it's shown stuck over. Um, the house is here, all the fields stretching out towards Raglan is shown, but we enlarge this section here. The most ancient route to Troy is not directly from Monmouth, but from the Monmouth to Raglan Road, there's a turn-off that goes to Trelick and Chepstow, which itself is a very ancient route. 
and to get to Troy House originally, we went off that Monmouth to Chepstow route, past the wall garden, and you ended up actually closer to the farm than you did the house. You see the same um, arrangement in the next estate map, 1765, where the house is here. We enlarge that. Remember the capital letter T, the oldest bit closest to the farmyard, where that's the farmhouse, stone barn, and largely now demolished stone building here. So we're coming off, again, the same arrangement, past the wall garden, which is shown on this estate map as a cherry orchard. Actually, I found evidence that it was created as a cherry orchard back in the 16th century. And then the track ends here, that largely demolished building. And enlarging it even more so you can see. Farmhouse, stone barn. Couldn't really have it just ended there. There must be a way into the farmyard. It's the key access route to Troy. So I put an advert in the local rag on Longshore Beacon, and a dear elderly lady answered and said she'd been living, she had lived at Troy Farmhouse before the Second World War and had a photograph of this building. And lo and behold, in that building is this Gothic archway. So we come down the track through this Gothic archway, and bits of this moulding actually are still on the floor in the farmyard. Um, we come into the farmyard, which actually, to my mind, was an anti reception courtyard. Where you get off your horse, if you turn left, you're then faced by that little watercolour entrance, remember? And you could access the oldest part of Troy House. We've got a similar arrangement here. There is a parallel at Tredegar House, not far from Troy. Um, it's typical of late medieval Tudor and even into the Jacobean period to have houses surrounded by courtyards. Where here we've got the main route in, this is Lano from Denisha. We've got an outer reception courtyard where you get off your horse, and we've even got stone pillars and walls like Troy. You go into an inner reception courtyard before you gain access to the house, and the whole surrounded by courtyards, some for pleasure gardens, others for orchards. If you look back at the estate map of 1765, outer reception courtyard. I think at this time the farmhouse wasn't just a service building, it was used as a residence as well. Inner reception courtyard, where that ancient door was positioned, and then an inner area, which I think at this time was most likely a private garden area, because it's overlooked by key reception rooms with those Jacobean ceilings. But when you look at the aerial photograph, that's the farmyard, chapel cloisters masking the inner reception courtyard. We've got courtyard upon courtyard, all these stone walls surviving, patched in places with bricks. We've even got a smaller courtyard here. There's the remains of another one here. And there was an ornamental stone archway here, however, demolished by a tractor. Um, now we've looked at the ownership history of Troy, and I thought it might actually shed light on who would have been in a position with stability in the land and sufficient wealth to engage in building and landscaping activity. And the earliest mention of an owner was this one, the Manor of Troy or Troy Parlour. It was in the ownership of the de Clare family, Earls of Gloucester and Hartford, in 1314, when there was certainly a Troy church on site. So John Scudamore, who you may be more familiar with, associated with Kent Church Court in Herefordshire, was Lord of Troy Parlour in 1425, and he married Earl Anglindor's daughter. I could find no reference to in accounts or any, any documentation to support the view that building and landscaping activity took place during their ownership. However, the next owner certainly did build. Sir so William Herbert of Troy was the illegitimate son of the first Earl of Pembroke, who was a key influence in the history of Wales in the early Tudor period. Um, in fact, Sir William Herbert of Troy inherited his father's attributes rather more effectively than the legitimate heir. And he was a great supporter of Henry VII. Uh, when 
His second wife actually was Blanche, Lady Troy, who when William died took on the role of Lady Mistress Dan Henry VIII, which meant he had, she had responsibility for the early education of three future sovereigns. So we've got a lot of important people living at Troy, and we have heard that they were most of the Tudor part of Troy House. He built a walk garden. There are accounts of him sending men to Flanders to purchase fruit trees. He built both a chapel for his tomb at Monmouth Parish Church, sadly that chapel hasn't survived, and he built property at Chester. And his influence in Wales, and went in particular on behalf of Henry VII, was acknowledged for the royal visit in August 1502, not previously recognised. William would have ensured that the house was suitable for a royal visit. And both Henry VII and Elizabeth of York stayed five days before moving on to her family seat at Raglan Castle. And it wasn't at Raglan that the king held his council meeting, it was at Troy. An inventory, which is housed at the National Archives, not very well known inventory, um, when I transcribed it for the first time, showed that it had echoes of that royal visit. Although it's 50 years or so years on from the royal visit, um, it still refers to chambers as the King's Chambers, the Queen's Chambers. And knowing that the son and heir of William Charles made very little alterations to Troy, I think it gives a picture of what Troy would have been like inside the house um, in 1502. So the king had three chambers, that's the transcription of one chamber called the king's little chamber. The queen had two, the king had three, and all of them were lined with brass tapestries, very expensive, canopy beds with silk hangings, in various colour themes, russet, blue, and green, and they had silk braids on them, so really very well furnished. When William dies, his son Charles inherits, and then when he dies, his oldest married daughter inherits Troy, Joan James, and within Charles' will, he says that if his debts aren't paid, please sell the estate to cover them, which she does. And she sells Troy House Estate to Edward Somerset, a key courtier in the courts of Elizabeth, and an even more important courtier for James I of England. If you look carefully, the medallion, as a little white horse with a man astride, he was master of the horse for Elizabeth, which meant really how control all the events in court, as all the events in court courses. He fascinates me because of his support of the Jesuits. The Welsh Mission was a Jesuit organisation, for want of a better word, that encompassed not just Wales, but all of the West Country. And Edward allowed them to settle and administer the Welsh mission from the castle of Braddon. And when it became rather too uncomfortable for that to continue, surrounded as they were by a um, Protestant area, uh, he gave them their, his um, estate on the Mono River at the Com, Glan Rothel. Remember where that letter was written? Originally. And I think the reason, this is my theory anyway, why Edward was anxious to purchase the whole of the Troy estate is that it was strategically useful uh, for his clandestine Jesuit activities. 1600, it's only shortly after Robert Jones had brought him from continental Europe to set up the Welsh mission. Edward was Admiral of the Seventh, he could control all the shipping up here. He had owned Chester Castle and had a private port, not subject to customs. If you went up the River Wye, he had control over the shipping there. He was soon at Troy, if you remember the map showing the River Trophy entering the River Wye. And if you can continue, um, you're onto the, from the Wye, you're onto the River Mono, all the way up to the Cumbre. Strategically, very important. And indeed, there are two priest holes at Troy, which the nuns blocked before they left in 1977. Um, Edward gave Troy estate to his son, Sir Charles Somerset, 
who married around about 1609, and then, as they did in those days, went off on a continental tour. He married a local heiress, Elizabeth Powell, who was the daughter of Edward Stewart, who lived at Troy. And it's Charles who substantially altered Troy House at the beginning of the 17th century. Not just the house, it's gardens and surrounding landscape. And the three plaster ceilings are down to him. Clay Gamble, the expert on plaster ceilings, that would date these, they're no later than 1620. And that fits in when Charles came back from his tour in 1612. It seems that they started to nest, they started to improve the house. This is one of the plaster ceilings with a lovely basket um, pedestal, one upstairs and the other one downstairs where this pedestal and the design of the plaster, I was able to um, compare it with this old photograph of the oak room at Troy. This room with that pedestal and what they've done is to hang the light fitting from it. When it came near to the 1601 auction, the both had stripped the room at Troy of this panelling and took it to Badminton where it lines the room to this day. Finally, the design landscape history, which is really why I got interested in Troy in the first place. Um, this is an exedra garden. This is what garden historians call such an arrangement. All it means is that there's a rectangle that then ends in a devil in the semi circle. And the nuns landscaped the east side of the house with wriggly paths and rockeries. None of that's visible now. They did it in the 1960s. And as soon as I saw that old photograph, it reminded me of the 1712 estate map which on the same side of the house shows a, 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 an exedra garden. Comes out, has a shoulder on it before it curves round, another shoulder, and then it comes back, actually a little bit further away from the house. You see it again on the 1765 one, same side, stretching out towards the river Trophy, returning, and here, more accurately drawn, about halfway along what we now call the farmhouse. An exedra garden would have been designed as a formal garden. And in 1712, we've got orchards here, but no trees here. It was still a formal garden. But when you look at this one, now it's been put down to orchard, same as the surrounding land. And I think the reason for that is after that tragic accident, you wouldn't want to maintain a formal garden, which is highly, highly costly, really costly. So they, because the family weren't living there anymore, it was decided to turn this into more productive land. I wanted to know whether the nun's exedra garden was on the same footprint as the historic one. So doing map overlays and accommodating for differences in scale, there's the nun's exedra garden. I hope that shows up for you in plan. And it sits on the same boundary, the north boundary, as the historic one, which goes further out towards the trophy, and then returns much further back from the house. It would have looked like this, the historic exedra. This is from um, Little Kip, Britannia Illustratis, Anstead. And it shows a typical exedra garden with shoulders ripped formally planted, a fountain would have been de river, and even like the um, Gilmore 1712 map of Troy, at the midpoint of the Deville, we've got an avenue of trees stretching down. I didn't show that. That's what we've got here. Trophy goes across the trophy and then out to the wider landscape. There is a painting which is held at Monmouth Museum. I hope I've got it insured because it must now be valued. Um, really, um, quite a lot of money. It shows the east side where the Exedra Garden lay before the first Duke started altering Troy House. So, more or less as it was in the time of Charles, who created the Plaster Ceilings. And annoyingly, 
There are trees in the way to prevent any sight of the Exutra garden. But if you look here, peeping out, there's a little garden area, it's a courtyard, with a quadripartite garden arrangement, probably an earlier Tudor garden. Um, I did conduct recitivity in the nun's Exutra garden and found nothing other than their buried pathways. Makes sense, because apparently in the 1930s, they took all the trees out and ploughed it, so it probably ploughed out anything of earlier dates. The farmhouse, garden courtyard, closest to the house, um, I found no um, evidence of buried pathways or walls, but it did come across in the resistivity as if the soil was compressed in that quadripartite arrangement of parts. So I think um, I'm just picking up there um, no paving as such, but compression of the soil with those pathways. Walk garden, the nun's cemetery is here. The original entrance isn't found in the middle of that wall, whereas there is a decorative one here, inserted in the pre-existing wall by Charles, who did the plaster ceilings. It looks like this from the outside, and when we look at the pe pediment, it's got the initials of the couple, Charles and Elizabeth Somerset, not a little flower. And guests being taken through this entrance into the wall garden would have read the cornucopia as meaning the bounty within, and then extract work, typical of late Tudor, Jacobean period. Inside the wall garden, that's what the entrance looks like, it's actually a little building, barrel roof, so you don't get your head wet as you walk through it, the water drains down the sides. There's the other bee bowl. But amazingly, there's all this rusticated moulding, which, again, Charles would have seen on his uh, continental tour. And it's very timely, the 1612 return from continental tour, an altering Troy house, because it's then that Sebastian Serlio's treatise on architecture was published in English for the first time. And it's literally like a pattern book. So if you want rusticated moulding, turn to this page. There it is. And there it is in situ at Troy. I've not come across anything similar in any other building in Wales or England. And if there's anybody before me now that can uh, tell me about it, please speak to me, Dorian Shelby. Finally, taking you out into the wider landscape, we've got um, a wooded ridge here, high above Troy House, located here. And it echoes the fact that this is the site of the original Deer Park, Troy Park Wood. And still remaining, we've got bits of the original stone enclosing wall. Here, parts which are as tall as me. But I want to take you to a little ruined building, which is located 300 metres from the house on rising ground. It's ruined, taken over by a hindley, but it's ashlar. And this string course here is just like the string course on the little entrance building. So I'm pretty sure that this was also built by Charles Somerset, who did the plaster ceilings. Cadillac said this is a game larder, but when you just scrape a little soil away from the surface, there's an exposed lead pipe with a broken end. There's another one on the opposite wall going out of the building. So what this is, is a conduit house. There would have been a lead tank between the broken ends of pipe. And water from the springs high up on the ridge would have been channeled down lead pipes, because this is a rich estate, collected in the tank, and then with a series of stock hogs allowed to flow down to the house. So he also did Charles seek to the water supply. There is another ruined conduit house on the landscape as well. And then uh, during the Civil War, Charles stayed at Troy and received paintings and wood panelling from Raglan when it was under siege in 1646. Uh, Charles died in 1665 and left Troy to Henry, who would become the first Duke of Beaufort, and actually lived there for a while when he returned from exile, and before he then inherited Badminton, which then became the main family seat. And we've come full circle, as you know that he then aggrandised Troy 
for his only surviving son and heir, and the fatal accident. So overall, Troy House's pleasure gardens, the war garden, the farm, and the surrounding parkland are shown to be a rare surviving example, particularly in Wales, of a medieval estate with Tudor, Jacobean, and Caribbean arrondissement. And if you could go back to its last really great heyday, just before that um, awful accident, and we come out of the house on the east side into that ancient Exedra garden, we'll walk through it and see what it would be like. Good, it's working. So it's formally planted, it's late 17th century, we haven't heard of the capability ground yet. There's a difference in level there which still exists to this day. There's the fountain that I can't prove existed, but any aristocrat worth his salt would have had one in his Exeter garden. And then if you remember, in the midpoint of the curve, there's an avenue of trees stretching out across the trophy, further on into the wider landscape. And then as we swing round to look at the east side of the house, against the walls there would have been fan fruit trees and roses, statues which would be classical by now, not um the word. <laughs> heraldic, sorry. Uh, hedging used to create little sun houses, typical of the time, orange trees, to the late seventeenth century. So there's the North Range, hard, the old part, the medieval part, and that entrance there before the chapel was built is still within living memory. And map regression, which I haven't talked about, and surveys show on this side of the house, there was a huge water parterre, again, characteristic of the late 17th century, fed by the nearby river Trophy. Orchards beyond, still these walls existing. And as we come to land back down in front of the North Range, it's stuccoed, and that shows up very well. The red sandstone surrounds of the windows, which are still there, and we've got the Beaufort um, crest, the portcullis, which in the 1960s came loose, and the nuns were in danger of being guillotined every time it went in. So they took it down and put the statue of the Virgin Mary which, unlike a lot of the houses, actually survived to this day. Thank you for listening.